Hey guys, welcome to my very first interview. Uh, I'm joined here by none other than Bud Moeller. I'm very excited to hear more about you. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's my pleasure to do this. I've been racing cars for 32 years, so it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Fantastic. And and we both love Ferraris, right? So we have, we've got the Ferrari team going here. Um uh, you know, perhaps maybe you can start by telling us, uh, you know, where you live and uh, what you do right now and, and, and all that. Sure. I've uh, split my time between McLean, Virginia and Melbourne, Florida. Um, but most of the time, probably about 70% of the year, we're on the road. Uh, a lot of that is racing, but I also sit on half a dozen nonprofit boards and uh, we shuttle between Virginia and Florida. So between all those things, we're never in any one place for, for a long time. And that's pretty much my life. I'm not working for money anymore. Um, most of my, if you want to call it work, is really volunteering my uh, strategic consulting skills to nonprofits for free. So that's my stage of life at this point. Oh, no, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, I also see that you go to Hawaii a lot too, right? So that's a lot of flights. It, it is a lot of flights. Between all the international flights to Europe and then to Hawaii, we're you know, just about circling the globe. We have a, we have a restaurant uh, in Hawaii. We were partners with some other people uh, and a restaurant in Maui. So we try to get out there a couple times a year just to check on it. I'm not a operating partner. I'm just an investor. Uh, but it's a great fun thing to, to be involved with. Gotcha. So you, you got a lot of things going on and you're obviously very busy. So as, as everyone can imagine, we're very thankful to have you here, right? Um, what other things do you like to do for fun? Do you play games? Uh, are you into any, you know, you watch sports or art or anything like that? Well, for me, being a car guy, my primary sport to watch is Formula One and IndyCar racing. Yep. Um, um, I, I do some, you know, some local car things. But other than that, I'm a pilot, so I like to fly. Oh, that's right. That's right. I plane, we fly all over the country. I haven't been out. Well, I've been to Canada, but not uh, otherwise to any other countries yet. Uh, but yeah, we use that for transportation as well as for fun. Um, I lived in the Bay Area for 14 years, so we became big fans of Napa Valley, so I do a lot of wine events. Uh, this year is a little different. We're having to do them all virtually. But uh, yeah, I typically host fun wine things for friends, and we uh, all get a chance to learn about wine and experience some really good ones. And then uh, I guess my other strange passion is art. I collect art. We've been collecting since the early 80s and have mostly uh, contemporary uh, art. So a lot of the big, you know, main contemporary guys that everybody would have heard of from the last century and this century. And that would be paintings and maybe sculptures, perhaps? Yeah, we have a few sculptures as well, more paintings and sculptures, but we've run out of wall space. So starting to move more into sculptures now. Gotcha. And, and, uh, Obviously, this is a more focused on cars, and you know you, you're you're well versed in a lot of things. So maybe we can start with your very first car, and and I can actually show that to to everybody on stream. I I got it from your page, and tell us about your first car. So I learned to drive actually on a Mustang, and back in the '60s, there was a big pony car war between the Camaros and the Mustangs, and then. AMC had their Javelin, and then a couple of other people tried to join in as well. But uh, I learned to drive on a Mustang, but my first car that I bought was a Camaro, 68, just a 327 small block. But for a kid that uh, just graduated high school and was going to college, it was quite a good fun that, that, That's pretty cool. My first car was an Oldsmobile, so you got me beat. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so I've been a car guy, you know, since actually my dad bought a Mustang in 66 and I started to read everything I could about cars and got very much into, you know, the whole pony car thing back then and then uh, watched a lot of racing as well. I went to high school in England and so we were not far from Silverstone. So I actually watched a lot of Formula One back in that era, you know, Jackie Stewart and those kind of guys were, you know, were the big players back then. So yeah, it was Definitely my blood from my teenage years. Is that where you got started with this motorsports on Formula One right away? Or did you watch other things like uh, other kinds of racing? I think, that, I think the very first race I watched at Silverstone was probably just touring cars. But uh, F1 was my first big professional event. Yeah, and I've 
been hooked on F1 ever since. Yeah, that's what I know about people that get into F1. They just do it forever, right? They they love it. Yep, absolutely. You know, you, there's a lot of drama and there are a lot of great drivers and team rivalries. You know, I think a lot of people have watched the series on Netflix uh, about Formula One, and it certainly brings it alive and kind of makes you want to get in there and know more and watch these people. And so, yeah, I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, speaking of movies and cars, what did you think of the Ford versus Ferrari movie? You know, I, I, it, it was interesting. I mean, I think it really told the story more about Ken uh -huh. himself than, than the true rivalry. Um, you know, you certainly get it from the domestic, from the Ford perspective. They didn't show much on the Ferrari side. Um, but it was, you know, it was, I thought it was a good movie. That The thing that I loved about it was that most general people, whether they're car people or not, watched it and really enjoyed it. So that's the mark of a really good movie. For me, I think, and for a lot of people that I know in the car world, the, the more you know about cars, the less you like the movie because you could see some things were kind of staged. That's true. <laughs> it's still a great story. I, I also think about Rush. Same uh -huh. thing with that. You know, that was, uh, uh, you know, fictionalized but pretty accurate um, portrayal of that, you know, really tough fight for the championship between Lauda and Hunt. I thought they did a really great job. Again, some of the racing was stylized. A lot of my guys that I race in, historic Formula One with were in that movie racing their cars. So, you know, I know I knew a lot of those cars and people and uh, that's, that's... They talk about the sequences and stuff, but that was also another good movie. And again, I think a lot of non-car people watched it and thought it was a great story. Great. Yeah. And, and um, so you obviously in, into racing, you got into it. Um, how did you get into it? Like actually racing, racing, you know, like you, Obviously, you drive around fast and, and streets and all that, but how did how did you get in like that? So it's a it's a pretty simple story. I was doing some amateur uh, racing, SCCA racing in my twenties. Um, went on to be fourth in the country in my class, and so you know I had, had a little bit of skill, I guess. Uh, but for my thirtieth birthday, my wife bought me a four day racing school with Bondurant that used to be at uh, Sears Point, Sonoma. And uh, the first two days were in race prepared Mustangs. And I thought that was super cool. But the second two days, we got into little Formula Fords. Mm -hmm. Once I got into that open wheel car, sitting ex with your helmet exposed to the air, you can see the tires, the grip was fantastic. The car was super nimble. I said, I need to do this. So we saved money for a year or two and then went racing and have been racing ever since yeah you just kept doing that that's great I, I did some driver education events and but nothing with the open wheel that's got to be a, a you know an interesting feeling right um is that almost like being in a motorcycle i'm not sure if you've ever been in a motorcycle for people that never done it yeah i haven't but it's probably very close because you're out there in the air you uh -huh. know you don't, you don't have the leaning that you do with a bike but i'm sure it's a lot of the same feeling because you you feel the air and you're working against the air, you know, particularly in a formula car, it's, it's going to force your neck forward and backwards and yes. you know, head buffeting at high speeds. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started in those little formula cars, they probably only generate maybe one and a half G's, which today uh, in the 599 XX uh -huh. that we were in the Ferrari program, that's probably about one and a half G's, but the, F1 cars are four and a half to five G's. So it's uh, three times the, the uh, stresses and yeah. neck forces primarily that you'd feel in the uh, smaller cars. Gotcha. I want to show the people here, the five, your 599XX right there. I've seen that a few times. And I love that thing. That thing is pretty cool. Just one of your many race cars. Um, but the, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was going to say the 599XX, they based it on the, 599 GTO chassis, chassis yep. which obviously was an evolution of the 599 GTB. So this car, they put tons of uh, carbon fiber bodywork, big wing, uh, exhaust out the side, some super interesting aerodynamic tricks. Uh, they actually have a fan in the trunk that sucks air through from tunnels underneath and creates active downforce like those fan cars they had experimentally back in the 60s and 70s um so it's it's a rocket ship it's about 750 horsepower so it's uh it's a handful yeah it's pretty cool you said there's a fan to suck in air and it's not to help with the airflow to cool it but for downforce is that for right downforce. 
Yep, absolutely. So you think about, I think there was a, a car that Brabham built back in the late 60s or maybe early 70s. Mm -hmm. And they call it the fan car. And if you look at the back of it, it was a Formula One car. It had this huge fan on the back. And what they were doing was, even though driving through the air created a lot of downforce, they spun that fan, which sucked more air through, which made the aerodynamics even more efficient. So same idea here, but on a smaller scale. Yeah, that's amazing. I never thought it would be that significant that you would you know, put a fan just for that. I figured it was all just wings and things. So <laughs> that's pretty great. Uh, one thing you mentioned that kind of uh, caught my, my ear was uh, you've never had a motorcycle because you've, you've flown planes, you've flown, you know, you've driven race cars, but you've never had a motorcycle. And I suspect I know why, but maybe you can tell us why. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward story. My wife is a nurse and we got married and her very first job was working at a nursing home, which has two types of uh, disabled people. Very, very old people who have lost their ability to walk and very, very young people who have lost their ability to walk. And all of those are from motorcycle accidents. Yeah, and that's an unfortunate thing. It's happening even now. And uh, she's a smart woman, right? Because I think, you know, odds are you'll get into something eventually, right? And and it's uh, whatever happens there is a lot likely that, you know, it'll be uh, it'll be terrible, not just a fender bender. Yeah. And for me, you know, being as aggressive as I am, anytime I'm trying to enjoy a nice drive, uh, she knows I would. I would just have been in the nurse in the nursing home, probably in my twenties. So she made a smart decision by putting that on the do not list. And so she's into cars too, I'm sure, right? And I've met her, and I'm gonna let you answer that. Tell us yeah. about about her passions on that. Maybe her car. Yeah, she's come along quite a way, and it's probably as I've dragged her in more than having any uh, historical interest in cars. Although her high school boyfriend did drive his father's Corvette, <laughs> 60 something Corvette. So she, she got a little bit of taste of cars early, but uh, more through me and just hanging around me and doing stuff with me and, and all that. We've owned Ferraris since I was 26. Yep. So she's been around cars for a long, long time. And um, now she's got a Maserati Ghibli and a Ferrari Portofino. Yeah, and so. I have it right there. That's the one. And I, oh, I love that color. Yeah, so she's definitely enjoying that car. That's been a new addition for her. Just uh, just came several months ago, and she is absolutely having a blast. Yeah, I bet. And it's a convertible hardtop too, I think, right? Yep, exactly. Which is just perfect for you know all all weather, but particularly in the summertime. Yeah. And and obviously you you love Ferraris, but you do have other cars, and I was surprised to see one in particular that you may have still. And that's the Aston Martin. Yeah, we'll see which uh, which picture you have there. There we go. That's uh, my 06 uh, Aston Martin V Advantage. I bought that right as it came out. Uh, lovely car. I love the styling. It's what I like particularly about this car is it's got a lot going for it. It's hand built. Yep. Uh, it's unique styling. You can always tell an Aston when you see one. Uh, it's got great performance. Um, and it was, uh, relative to a lot of other cars, pretty affordable and you don't see a lot of them around. So you had five great factors going for you with this car and it seemed like a no brainer to get one. And I, I still love it. I, I, uh, I've had it now 14 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I have about 15,000 miles on it. Um, cause we drive through a lot of different cars, but it's still one of my favorites. It's okay. a comfortable, speed. right? Six-speed, lovely car. Yeah, very comfortable. Got it. And uh, how do you fit? Uh, it's, you know, I think you may have like quite a few cars, right? So, so I'm going to show a picture that you had uh, available, right? And I think it's your garage. Uh, see if I have something like that. But uh, apparently, I guess I don't have that. But this is the Ferrari dealership's garage, and this car. Do you still have this one? This is the yep. GTO. That's 599 GTO. I actually yeah. drove it uh, last weekend. <clears throat> it's a it's a great car. I have to tell you a story on this one. Sure. <clears throat> so 
I uh, had a 599 GTB and I, for a number of years, I would have either the mid-engine V8 mm -hmm. or front-engine GT car. And then I'd alternate back to the mid-engine V8 and then I'd want to go to the GT car and I kept going back and forth, back and forth, every iteration as they came out. And I was like, I've got a mid-engine V8 and I want to keep it. I don't want to get rid of it, but I do miss that GT car. So I had a friend who owned this um, 599 GTO and it's signed under the hood by Rubens Barrichello, who is the driver, former F1 driver, who drove my F1 car, my 03. So I said, yeah, I got to have this car. Uh, I was friends with the owner. We had a meeting on a Sunday night, shook hands with him, did the deal. And he called the dealership where it was at the next day and said, hey, this car is sold, you know, take it off the market. Well, my friend Graham Rahal, the IndyCar driver, yep. called the dealership that day wanting to buy that car because that was <laughs> originally his car. So he wanted to buy it back. And they said, no, sorry, it's already been sold. He said, well, can I negotiate with the, the owner? And they said, yeah, we don't think, uh, you know, he'll, he'll do anything. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, is it my friend Bud Muller? And they said, yeah, it is. And so he called me, he said, hey, I understand you're buying this car. You know, can I change your mind? Is there any way I can buy it? And I said, no, you know, it's important to me because Ruben signed it. So I'm, I'm going to hang on to it, but I'll, I'll let you know if I sell it. And he said, why are you so interested in getting this one? He said, well, because I love the spec of this car, the, the silver, black stripe, red interior. And he said, I loved it so much. I have a 458 Speciale that I had specced exactly the same way. And I was going to buy this one, put the two together and sell them as a matched pair yep. you know, to hopefully some collector. And he said, mm -hmm. if you won't sell me, the, let me have the GTO, you should buy the Speciale from me so you can have the matched pair. So I did. So oh, I that's right. I've seen that. 458 Speciale, this silver, black, striped, red interior. Yeah. yeah and uh, actually, here you go. We'll show that to, to everyone. That's why they match. I, I've that's seen pretty, that. There you go. You've got the two of them together. There yeah. you go. And so I'm going to take <laughs> Speciale out tomorrow for a drive. That's pretty interesting. Um, so let me ask you this. Do you know someone named Ricky? Ricky Greer? And the reason I say that is because he has a matching... <laughs> G, uh, TDF and a matching Speciale in yellow. So I don't know if it's a thing. Ah, and you might have seen that on the, the pictures uh, on the Ferrari's I dealership. Did. Yes, I did. Now, is that the pair that just got sold? Yep, that's the one. Okay. So I think I, I see a trend here with the matching uh, kind of thing, right? So Yeah, certainly yeah. with um, you know with the Pista, everybody did a lot of very cool variations on the stripes and things like that. So you might find some more people trying to match them up, but this pair had already been done essentially by somebody else. So I just kind of fell into it, which, which was not bad. Yeah. No, so he was trying to buy it from you, but instead he sold you something else. <laughs> that's, a great, did, that's a great, it's a great story. I have to uh, give him first ride refusal. So if I do choose to sell, yeah, this guy I have to call. He sounds uh, like he's Ferrari also first ride refusal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Graham, Graham goes through a lot of different cars. He yep. had this, sort of lime green Porsche 918. Uh, he has a purple Ford GT. Yeah. You know, so he's had lots of very cool cars and, you know, he definitely does like Ferrari and his dad loves Ferraris as well. But, um, you know, he, he, I think, you know, he cycles through them cause he's, he's got car dealerships and stuff and they're, they're always buying and selling cars. Yeah. I remember seeing his red Carrera GT. Uh, that was yep. pretty, uh, one of his favorites, I think. Yeah. But, that yeah. But that's great. So um, you do have some uh, a Pista, which you did mention. That's I think I believe that's your latest one, right? The latest acquisition that you might have now. Yep, that one just arrived a few months ago as well. And um, if your people that are watching know anything about the the Pista, uh, that's kind of the 488 on steroids. So every time Ferrari gets to the end of a run of a model these days. They do a special version. So they did it with the Scuderia when it was, you know, mm -hmm. generations ago. They did the Speciale for the 458. They've done the Pista for the 488. Um, and so they pour in a lot of cool technology. They bump the engine, horsepower. They, they do some other cool things. And if they turn out a really fantastic car, then they take some of that same technology like the F-duct 
uh, in the front and move it into their next model, which they did with the F8 Tributo. Yep. The cool thing about this one is the Pisa is a limited edition. I think they only would sell them to people who had five Ferraris or more. Mm -hmm. But this particular version is the Pista Piloti. And I believe there's like 40 in the world, maybe 50. Nobody's got an exact count. Um, but they only made these for the factory drivers like myself. Oh, we, that's the significance. Okay. We got to put our cars, racing cars number on the side. So I put the two from my Formula One car. And my son-in-law, who also races with the 599, put that number 13 on his Pista Piloti, which is silver and mine's blue. Yeah, I've seen that too. So so tell me about the number, now that you bring that up. Number two, is that something you chose or was given to you and you stuck with it? Yeah, that was the number that was on the car when I bought it. It was driven by Ruben Barrichello in 03. Mm -hmm. Michael Schumacher was the champion the year before and for a few years before and after. Yep. And champion gets to have the number one if they want. And then the teammate usually takes the number two. Now, since that era, they've changed it to where any of the drivers can have whatever the number they want, which is why Hamilton is 44 and Got you know, it. things like that. But back in those days, the champion was able to have number one and their teammate number two. So that's why the Barrichello car had the number two on it. That makes sense. And your son-in-law, 13, not because he likes Dan Marino. No, nope, <laughs> lucky number in Italian. So that's Got why it. you... that's the lucky number, right? Um, all right. So, so tell me about um, what you're doing these days instead of, uh, you know, you're still racing. Do you plan on doing that un until a certain point? You're just going to keep doing that until you feel like you can't. What well, do you, what know, do you... it's, you're either going to run out of capability, mm -hmm. which would be health related mm -hmm. or money, um, you know, or maybe just interests move other directions. But, you know, there, there are a few different reasons people quit racing. Um, this will be my 33rd season. 33. You know, wow. 33rd season yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's expensive and it takes a ton of time. We do probably between the Clienti program and our historic Formula One in, in North America, Mm -hmm. We probably do 14 races a year and those all get squeezed into about six months, six or seven months. So what it really means is every other week we're somewhere. And when we go, it's usually four days, three or four days at the track and then a day to get there and a day to come back. And by the time you do that, you've burned up an entire week. So two weeks out of the month is already shot. And if we choose to stick around and vacation wherever one of the cool places are that we're racing, then, you know, we, we're gone three quarters of the time. So it's a, it's a big commitment. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, time is, time is money and you know, there's, you can't buy more time. So I guess that would make sense. Right. So yep. speaking of time, you did break, this is just one of the many records you've broken, right? I have your on video. Perhaps you can watch it real quick. The last 10 seconds of it. And I'll show that. <laughs> Yeah, so tell us about that. That's pretty cool. And I can tell you're very, very happy. Yeah, so we, um, this particular car, the uh, F2003 GA, which was the Formula One car that Ferrari raced in that 2003 season, um, is part of a program that Ferrari runs and we race all over the world. Each year, we usually come to North America for one or two race weekends. And if it's two, they package them back to back. Um, and that's our only chance to show our friends in the States what this is all about. All the rest of them are in Europe or Asia or somewhere. Um, so this particular year, 2012, um, we had, or actually this might be 11, 11 or 12, I don't remember. We, we uh, brought this car to Sonoma and broke the track record there that weekend. The next weekend we were at Laguna Seca broke the track record there as well. And then every year thereafter, we broke a record. In 13, we broke it at uh, Mont Tremblant, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, 14, 
I'll have to look back. That might have been uh, New Orleans. I mean, every, every year we'd go somewhere and, and break records. The last one we broke was a couple of years at uh, Go at Road Atlanta. Um, so it's one of those things where this car is amazingly quick and we're racing at tracks in the US where um, they didn't have this era of Formula One car. So whatever else they had there, we smack them. For example, at New Orleans in, I think that was actually 2015. Um, we went there, the Indy cars had raced there in the spring and Montoya's qualifying lap. I was going to ask that. Tell me, tell us about that. That's really cool. Yeah. So Montoya, they, they qualified. I think they had their race in April. His qualifying lap was, well, I think, a 121, something like that. And I believe we got down to 118. So three seconds faster than the Indy cars. And, it, you know, we weren't running minimum fuel and all that kind of stuff. We were just out there to, you know, to drive. I mean, we didn't have the tanks completely full, but it wasn't like we were doing a three lap qualifying run either. Um, but yeah, I went out there and smacked that by three seconds. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Can you, can you help, help me understand how that's even possible? Cause it sounds like, you know, this is a, a guy, Juan Pablo Montoya is, you know, this is what he does every day, day in, day out. This is what he's paid to do. Right. And he has a whole, you have your team too, but keep in mind, you know, he, he, this is, he has a team dedicated to doing this. And then you just mentioned it was, you weren't equipped the same way. And it sounds like the cars are different too. So tell me, how, how is that even possible besides sheer talent? Yeah, well, part, oh, it's just sheer talent, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, the cars are very different. So the Indy cars probably had in that year, maybe about 800-ish horsepower. Uh -huh. uh, my F1 car has 930 horsepower. Okay. And a couple of hundred pounds lighter. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, we didn't have all of the setup engineers and multiple yeah. sets of wings and all that stuff. We, we basically brought the car with the wings that were on it. Yep. And Ferrari brings like a hundred people. So, I mean, there's, there are data people and tire people and, you know, mechanics and all that sort of stuff for my car and the other F1 cars that'll drive. Um, but it's not like having, you know, years and years of data and doing exactly. computations. So a, a lot of it is that, you know, that extra hundred and something horsepower and a couple hundred less pounds. A lot of it is just. And I talent. Think, There's got to be talent because you must, you must have felt it that day too, right? You, you were in the zone, so to speak. Would so, you say so? Yeah. What's interesting is, you know, when, when we go to a track and I never raced in New Orleans. I mean, that was the other strange thing. I didn't have any simulator time or anything. Yeah. I never raced there before. I watched Montoya's lap on the plane on YouTube mm -hmm. for an hour just to, <laughs> just to get, get right yeah of the corners and all that sort of stuff and then we went out there in my very first session we were like a 122 and i thought man we're gonna kill this guy this weekend and sure enough i mean we just kept dropping and dropping and dropping the time that's amazing i mean that's that's really it's hard for me to explain how great that is if you kind of even try to relate it to other sports right that's just sure. mind-bogglingly amazing well, the other big one, um, although it's not open wheel to open wheel, is at Road Atlanta, the track record there was one of those like LMP cars. Yes. Or prototypes. And um, that track record was 106 mm -hmm. something. And we got down to 101 something. So that's five seconds difference. And I had raced at Road Atlanta once and it was eight or 10 years earlier. So it was essentially like a new track to me. But again, watched watched a lot of YouTube video to get in the groove, went out there. Now, taking nothing away from all the work the team does because they are resetting and recalibrating all sorts of things in the engine and the transmission and the suspension between every set of laps. And we're changing things on the steering wheel and they take all that into account as well. We'll spend a half an hour on the track and 45 minutes in telemetry working with Mark Janay, who was a Formula One driver and is now our yep. driver to just find out where can we pick up more time? What are we doing? And we're looking at video and the, the data uh -huh. and trying to decide once you turn here, try here, break 10 meters later, carry this gear instead of that gear. And eventually you keep dropping the time and set records. It's crazy. Yeah. It feels like, do you, do you feel, I feel like this, but do you feel like if you had, if you could go, you know, what you have now kind of had a little bit more time, you had like a couple, you know, a decade or two, would you race uh, professionally 
just go all out? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, when I was um, racing in 1990, I was on my way to the IndyCars. Um, we had raced Formula Atlantic, did really well. We were going after sponsorship. And in the wintertime before the season came, the economy started to turn down. And we went into a bit of a recession. And every sponsor we talked to said, we would love to do Indy with you, but it's got to be next year. It's got to be next year. We got to get through this recession. We got to see how it goes. Um, and they didn't want to be throwing money at a new program if they were laying off people, of course. Yeah. Um, so I had this fork in the road of, do I go to Indy cars, give up my, I was a management consultant, mm -hmm. give that up, do that. Um, because on the consulting side, my company wanted me to move to Singapore. Mm. And so it was go to Singapore and stay with the company or tell the company no and try to survive for a year or two and scrap together some sponsorship and hope I can go to Indy. Yep. And I ended up doing the staying with the consulting thing and doing this racing still on the side. So I, I don't know how I would have done. I mean, I've obviously got a, a little bit of skill still 30 years later or whatever it is. Yes. Um, 20 years, yeah, 30 years later. Yeah. Since 1990, right. It's 2020. So 30 years later, I'm still doing all this stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I might've, I might have been okay back then. Uh, what I do know is one of the guys I was racing with in Atlantics did get sponsorship money. He was from another country, brought sponsorship in that country. And that year that we would have been together qualifying for Indy, he crashed in qualifying and died. Oh, yeah. So maybe, maybe it's a good thing it didn't happen. In the yeah, country. you never really know what would have happened, but the good news is right now you, you still get to race and you still kept your management uh, consulting practice and, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, did, did well there, your family, everything's just great. So you still get to race even now, you know, I don't, I don't know any kind of sport I could keep doing uh, that long. Right. Yeah. Cause I'm friends with a lot of IndyCar F1 drivers and you know, the F1 guys usually retire in their mid to late thirties at the latest. Yep. In our, you know, you can go into your forties, but it's only NASCAR that goes into their fifties. Um, you know, and here I am a little beyond that and I'm still getting to do this. So I feel very privileged to be able to still get in a car and have a lot of fun. Yes. So I'm showing here your car at Ferrari Washington and that's me when you, when you let me sit in it. Yeah. Right. So tell me, is this, uh, is this your second car, current car? Uh, what's what's up with the uh, the cars these days for this? Um, so this is the car we used in the F1 Clienti program with Ferrari, mm -hmm. the one that the factory maintains. Um, I also have a car that, uh, well, I did have two. I just sold one that I race in a North American Formula One series. Uh, one was a Ferrari, also number two by coincidence, <laughs> who was driven by Gilles Villeneuve back in the oh, okay. 80s season. And Schechter was a champion the year before, so he carried number one. Villeneuve had number two. And then I also have a car that was driven by Derek Daly um, and his son, Connor Daly, is racing Indy cars. And uh, that's that's a car that uh, I also race in the North American Formula One program. Gotcha. And, and of course, uh, you, you don't keep all the cars. You want to sell which ones and kind of rotate around, right? That's how, how it works. And would you keep them if you, if you, you know, or what? how does that work? Owning yeah. these kind of cars, I have no I'd idea. Pro I probably regret every car I've ever sold in my life. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean these these cars they don't come available very often. They're expensive, but they're also very expensive to maintain. And having, you know, more than one is even a luxury. So, uh, you know, we we have to try and always uh, take a look at that. I also had a '97 uh, Ferrari F310B Formula One car that was ex Schumacher and Irvine. And I had that one for, I raced that for three or four years before getting the 03 car. And then we sold that one a few years ago. And now, now, of course, I wish I had hung on to it. But um, yeah, they're all, they're all great. It's just, I mean, it's like with anything in life, you know, you, you can collect stuff, but at some point it's more trouble than it's worth. And with cars particularly, if you're not driving them, that, that's really not a good thing because, you know. Things, it can't be Jay Leno. With with yeah. with a whole staff maintaining them, right? <laughs> exactly. That's what you need. I mean, I've got I've got older muscle cars that I haven't driven in a year, and it's not good for them to just sit. You know, the 
seals and the, the little O-rings and the shock absorbers. Yeah. You know, or whatever. And, you know, you got to do a lot of work then to get them back on the road. So you're a caretaker and you let someone else do the proper take care. Right? Yes. Exactly. I, I guess that's a good way to, to look at it. So you mentioned watching YouTube to prepare for some events, <laughs> right? But you didn't mention simulations. Do you do, you do any of that at all? or? I, I do, but um, I, I don't have a really sophisticated kit. So, um, and, and I only, you know, use like a platform like, you know, the PS or maybe the Wii or whatever. Mm -hmm. Sort of whatever game is available. And if the track is on that, I'll, you know, drive it and learn it. But um, yeah, I don't do iRacing and, and all that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll tell you my one challenging simulation story. Um, so year, years and years ago, I had never driven at Watkins Glen and we're getting ready to do a race there that first time. And the only simulator program that was available with Watkins Glen on it at that time was NASCAR. So I thought, okay, that's great. Yeah. So well, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of ramp it up from what the NASCAR car does. So I drove the NASCAR car, you know, I don't know, I drove for probably like a week. I knew that track inside and out. So we go to Watkins Glen, first session, hop in the car, head out. And I'm like, you know, I'm like pumped. I know this track. Yeah. I do so well, you know, and I, and I go through this turn, I go through this turn, go through this turn. And I'm going along and I'm getting ready to get to the part where I turn right. And it's like, wait a minute, this track is going straight. And then it's like, oh, okay, here's a right-hand turn. But, whoa, this turn is very different. And now there's a left. NASCAR chops off the boot, and they drive a short turn. <laughs> and so I never got to drive. And I had no idea that I was missing that whole course of the track. So I kind of learned my lesson. And, I, you know, simulators are helpful. But, you know, watching something that somebody else has really driven on that track in the last year, that's probably a lot better. Yeah, that's a good point. Um Wow. Actually, so this is one thing I'm very curious about, right? So I do a lot of, you know, amateur type of driving events. And, you know, sometimes I have someone, an instructor telling me how to do this, where to turn, where to do, take the apex, etc. right? The breaking points. And I never remember it because I don't do it enough and I don't do the whole study, etc. But what if, you know, when you're going so, so fast, high speed, things like that, and you say, okay, I'll do this. Is it just by memory or reaction? And how, it, it's so fast that sometimes I look at something and I thought, oh, that, that looked like it should have been the left, but it's actually a right. Like, how do you reconcile what yeah. you remember and what you see and, and the speed, right? So I'll, I'll tell you how I typically train to, to drive a track, even a new one. Um, and I guess one of the benefits that I have that makes me a good driver is I have very good visual memory, like photographic memory. Wow. So okay. what I will do, I'll watch the video or drive a simulator. And what I then do for myself is I'll take a stopwatch and I will go ahead and close my eyes, start the stopwatch, and I will mentally, with my eyes closed, drive that lap. And I'll go through all the gear shifts, all the turning points, all the breaking points, all that stuff. And when I cross start finish in my mind, I hit the stopwatch and I look to see if I'm within a second or two of the lap times that I've been turning. And if so, then I feel like I've actually memorized the track pretty well. Right? Wow. Yeah. I can drive it in my mind at exactly that, you know, to a second or two, the same rate. That's pretty good because you know when you drive, if you if you're really racing, you need to memorize braking points, turning points, apex points, exit points, where you're going to accelerate. You know, braking pressure, gears. You know, there's a bunch of things to yeah. memorize every turn. And again, if I can memorize all that stuff, and and I'm literally as I have my eyes closed, I am moving my hands with this pretend steering wheel because there's a certain set of corners that are, you know, tighter radius and more turning. Yeah. And and I'm literally trying to drive that track. And then again, if I get it within a second or two, then I kind of got it down. And if not, I just drive it some more and then visualize it some more. So you have that. This it's not just really, you know, the 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 picture or the visual memory. You also have it's speed in your head, the gears 
you have your, where where the wheels need to be, and they all kind of line up within a second or maybe less. That's amazing. I I, I don't know anything that's that's anywhere close to that uh, in any sports or even esports, right? So is that something common, or is that something you do, or at the level that that you are, or the professionals? Yeah, the best drivers can do it. They've they've shown on TV sometimes the IndyCar drivers, they'll give them a piece of paper, they'll close their eyes and have them draw the track. And they'll literally draw the track and then bring it back. And certainly it's, they just about always touch at start finish and the track is exactly as it should be. So they've got that same sort of capability as well. Um, it, you know, it, it is hard to do. And so for me, if I can do that, it, it does two things. One, it means that I've got this dialed in pretty well. But the second yep. thing is if, if I have to work on a corner and where I feel I need to pick up the throttle a little bit earlier or I need to my, push my braking point a little bit later, I can close my eyes and drive 10 laps doing it the new way so that when I get out there, it kind of feels like I've done it before rather than like, oh my God, is the car going to stop? Wow. Yeah, that's like rehearsing in your, in your head. Yeah. That's kind of like what Stephen Hawking did for a very long time, you know, just kind of figuring things out. He made a whole world in his head and, yeah. and solved things in his head. That's yeah. that's mind boggling to me. Yeah, because I think for us, I mean, you know, going quick is one thing. Winning a race, that means you're going quicker than anybody else. But to set the outright track record of any car ever driven any lap at that track, you've got to get everything absolutely right. So it's not just like, Course. the day it's like go out and make sure you're as precise as possible everywhere and you know some tracks have been harder than others to crack but a lot of them fortunately we have had you know several seconds of margin but at Laguna Seca they had uh, that track record was held by a 97 Reynard IndyCar mm -hmm. it was back IndyCar and cart split yeah and it was the cart car which was absolutely rocket ship fast that same era car held the track record at Mont Tremblant as well. At Laguna, we only beat it by a few tenths. At Tremblant, I beat it by two or three seconds again. So yeah, those are those are pretty big margins, though. The, when you're talking seconds, that's yeah. that's amazing. Um, actually, that brings me to the next question. Um, you mentioned tracks, and some are tougher than others to break, etc. What is the hardest track, in your opinion, that you've driven it? Uh, well, the, I'll tell you that tracks can be complex for a couple of different reasons. One is they can have some really high speed sections that just take guts and your car has got to be set up completely right. When I think about the guys that drive the Indy 500, if their car is set up right, they can just about go flat through that entire track, right? They might have to lift a little bit or downshift to be able to pull out of a corner every mm -hmm. once in a while one of the three corners or something like that. But if their car is set up right, they're, they're going to nail it. But there are a lot of high-speed sections that are just hang on and hope you're, you're in the right place. The, the most classic place I think about is Eau Rouge at Spa. Okay. Um, you always see that on TV, but I, I tell you, television doesn't do it justice. It is this huge downhill, and you then compress and shoot up. It's kind of like almost like a trampoline, you kind of hit the bottom and you, the car is always bottom out. You hit the bottom and you're shooting nearly straight up and you're going up that hill. You can't see the exit because it flattens off at the top. So if you've hit the apex right and you're turning up that hill uh -huh. and you're pointed towards the left side of the track, you hope you've got it just right because if you do, when you come over the top and you land, you'll be just on the exit curve. That is done in Formula One cars completely flat at 200 miles an hour. Wow. And that's that, that takes, that takes a lot. But if you ask a lot of the drivers, they'll say that's one of their favorite sections of track on any track in the world. It's a leap of faith right there. Literally, there's just, you got to have balls of steel. I mean, it sounds like it, right? Do you, is yours originally super strong and then got honed by experience? How, how would you say the percentage is where you just kind of, how does yeah, that work? I, I, I don't have fear. It's kind of a weird thing, and it's probably a good thing for a racing driver. But I, I don't have the gene that creates fear. 
I, I'm actually pretty non-emotional. Huh. So uh, when I'm in the car, it's like it's like a computer driving. It's very. I powerful. see. And because I don't have the fear gene or feelings of fear, I just go out and do it. And there are times where I've done things like at uh, Silverstone, the first time I drove Silverstone, there's a section called Beckett's and Maggots. Mm -hmm. It's a weird British name, <laughs> but anyway. And so we're, we're reviewing, I I'm reviewed the F1 video and all that sort of stuff, but we're reviewing the telemetry before we go out. And the telemetry shows that you go into the very first of those corners flat out in seventh gear at 200 miles an hour before you just lift and downshift and twitch to the left at 190 something, lift, downshift, and twitch to the right. So you don't even touch the brakes. You're just using the aero forces of the car and the braking of the engine to just flick your way through these three corners from 200 down to 180 something at the end. Um, so I was like, okay, great, I can do that. So we get in the van and we go drive around and this looks like a slalom in a parking lot. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. How can this be 190 something, 200 miles an hour? Trust the car, the car will do it. You have to believe. I'm like, dude, really? In the big corner before that, it's like a 90 degree corner. It's yeah. 186 miles an hour. And it's like, that looks like, that looks like a intersection with a stoplight, you know, yes. how sharp that is. At least that's what it seemed in the van. It's like, nope, 196, take it to six gear, this RPM. Okay, great. So you trust in the data, trust that the car will do it, trust that the guys have set it up right, go out there, do it, and just believe it'll happen. If it doesn't, then they'll make some adjustments and you'll, you know, hopefully be able to do it on the next round. Yeah, that, that's great. So for for people that aren't too familiar with that whole uh, team and what they do and the study of it all, the numbers, the telemetry, basically to sum it up, uh, make sure I understand this. They did the study. They know this will work. They mathematically it works. Physics says so. You know, they, they confirm it by studying the track. They may have some some laser numbers, right? Is that correct? Yep. And so yeah. you're the last piece there that just has to pull the trigger. And if you don't have the fear, you have complete trust. Then of course you do exactly what it says. Yeah. And of correct. course, you know, I mean, they, and of course they, they, uh, they always push us because they, they know we're, we're going to do pretty well, right? Most places we go. So they always push us and they're like, well, okay, here's Schumacher's telemetry when he drove the 03 at Spa. Here's what he did. And then it's kind of like, okay, dude, you try and do that. You know, and, and I'm like, okay, you know, we'll see. How, well, how did Barrichello do? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, those guys are, were usually pretty close to each other. And yeah, so then, th then as we progress the weekend, we will overlay my telemetry on theirs and see what they're doing that I'm not or what I'm doing that they're not and, you know, see what we have to change to, to do it. It sounds like a great team that you have and, and you guys are all a great cohesive unit. Um, but you're you're a special part of that unit in in that you can execute what they say. Is that do you have you seen drivers that don't have that um, oh, yeah. bravery? Well, maybe lack of fear. They have the lack. They don't have the lack of fear, and you see them kind of they're they're a second or two behind just because of that. Would you or, would you say so? Yeah, or ten seconds. Or I mean, ten seconds. Huge. I think that's me. That's that's me because there's turns in there. My instructor tells me, I was like, I don't know, dude. That looks scary. I don't think I can do it, and I don't know if I'll, it'll ever go away. But this is good to hear <laughs> that there is different. Well, it, it's the benefit also of having driven open wheel cars for so many years. Yes, I mean, thirty three years in open open wheel cars, twenty five or twenty six, I think, is Formula One. Mm -hmm. So you know, a whole lot of seat time, and that means I know. Even if I change from you know the '97 car to the '03 car, I know theoretically what the car will do. We have the telemetry. I know, therefore, what gears I should be in, you know, roughly where I should be braking and all that sort of stuff. Although, you know, temperatures change, tires have evolved, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, everything's still got to be adjusted, and the only way you do that is by doing it and seeing what happens. Yes. Um, and um, you know, the the guys are great at at working with us to make it make it work. Some people are not as cerebral. Some people are not as 
lack of fear. Some people are not as experienced. Uh, some people have no intention of trying to get anywhere near track record or qualifying <laughs> time. They're just yep. out there to enjoy have their fun. Yes. Have a good time. And I respect that. I totally respect that. I'm just, because of where I'm at, I'm in a different spot. spot. So even for me, the very first time I drove Silverstone, I'd never driven it before. And it's a super high speed track with these crazy corners. I would have qualified 16th on the F1 grid that year. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, so, you know, I'm definitely hammering. special. Yeah, working hard to do it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you watch Star Trek. Do you ever watch any of that? There was some episode. Back, back in the day. Okay. Did you watch the one where uh, Captain Kirk was stuck in a simulation? He didn't want to leave. And because, I don't know if you remember this, I don't know exactly which movie it was, but he loved the simulation. He didn't care about the real world. And what got him to come out was he, there's a simulated area where he would jump his horse in real life and he would always get scared. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I'm not sure. Was it was he on the holodeck or something like that? Yeah, the- yeah. so what happened was when he jumped it, he was stuck in the, the simulated world and he loved it, he didn't care. But then when he jumped it, he wasn't, he didn't feel the fear because it, he knew it was fake. So then he thought, you know what? I need to get out there. This is not real. And, you know, you're kind of like, the, I don't know. Did you get diagnosed without the fear gene or is that just a saying you're saying? It's just a saying. Okay. You know? I was going to say, all right. Because there are some people that don't have fear, and you know, like actually not worried about jumping off and all that stuff. But you just happen to have a really good uh, way of holding yours back or something and you can't do you see that and there are other uh activities in, in life outside of racing yeah i mean i you know i'm a pilot too so oh well, uh, it's very similar things although i'm not doing acrobatics and things like that i would yes. love to but i'm not i uh, don't have an acrobatic plane um but that one is you know i'm usually flying with my family or others. yeah it's not the and you know then I, i'm trying to be like the best bus driver i can be you know be super smooth, don't spill their drinks, yep. you know, make sure everybody's having a good time. Be careful that as we adjust the pressurization up and down so it doesn't pop their ears too badly. I mean, it's totally different than being in a race car where you're trying to achieve something, you know. Gotcha. Would you say you're a thrill seeker though? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I don't deliberately go do risky things just to try and uh-huh. push the edge of my life. Uh-huh. But I do a lot of risky sports. I mean, I've done, you know, skydiving for years. I've done scuba diving, you know, this stuff. I mean, I, you know, there's there's that kind of thing, um, you know. But I, um, I I don't know that I need that thrill. But I guess if I weren't racing anymore, and you ask me, maybe I'd say I need. Yes, that yes, I was going to say that because. <laughs> A lot of people that are retired, they're professionals. They're looking for something, right? And, and uh, you're still doing it, so you haven't really missed out, uh, I don't think. So I'd like to touch uh, upon a different part of you, which is the business side. Can you tell us something about your business uh, experience, that that part of your life, and and you know whatever you care to share that may parallel what you're dealing with here? Sure. Yeah, I mean. Um... I was a management consultant. I worked with two of the world's largest consulting firms. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I started my career at Booz Allen, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. It's changed now names. But um, yeah, I I started after I got my MBA and started working as a consultant and did strategy work with them. And uh, we do strategy, which was about helping companies position the right way in their marketplace for their customers and against the competitors so they could win. Yep. We would devise all these very elegant strategies on what they should do, where, where they should position. And after a few years of that, companies would say, you know, that's really great, but we'd love to do that, but we have no idea how to change our company, yes. our organization and our capabilities to be able to do that stuff and be that way. So I then moved, migrated into organization design, operating models and things like that with org structures and decision Mm -hmm. matrices and teaming and all this kind of stuff so that the companies could transform the way they operated so that they could execute in a way that would achieve that strategy. And I designed 
a bunch of those for a number of years. And companies then would start to say, look, you know, elegant strategy, elegant operating model, but try as we can, we keep finding that people kind of keep wanting to go back to working the old way. Mm, yes. Uh, they haven't quite captured the vision of what we're trying to be and why it's important. And we've captured their mind in terms of telling them this is their job and here are the processes. We haven't captured their heart and their own understanding of why this is important and how to do it. So I then had to migrate downstream into all the soft side stuff around leadership and teams, yes. you know, behaviors and things like that. And as we put all three of those things together, strategy, operating model, and then all the leadership and teaming stuff, we essentially were doing total corporate transformation. So that became my sort of what I was known for in the world was doing this big corporate total transformation stuff. Um, I was at Booz Allen for 20 years. Accenture found me and hired me away to go start a practice for them, yep. doing exactly all of that. But they were multiples of the size of Booz yes. Allen. Yes. So a whole lot more resources at my disposal and we could pour a lot into you know intellectual capital and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I built that great practice for them and then uh, ended up retiring. So, so I have a question for you. Um, can you give us some tips on what you've learned help with adoption to your system? Because obviously you, in the beginning, you just kind of laid out the system, but they didn't really get it into their hearts. So how did you get adoption? Yeah, I think, I think the big thing is you can tell people what to do, but if they don't understand why it's important to do it that new way, why that new way is better than the old way, they'll just keep wanting it to do, do it the old way. The, the thing I always like to do with people is I say, look, cross your arms, right? Yes. Cross your arms. And okay, so your left arm is over your right arm, all right? My, actually, mine is left over right too. Are you left-handed? I'm right-handed. I, yeah, I don't know why I did that. I just maybe, it, I've been yeah, training my left hand. So. I'm left-handed and it's just, it's just a force of habit. Nobody oh, okay. tells us which arm to put over which arm. It's just a force of habit. But now cross your arm the other way with the other arm on top. See, and you didn't even tuck your hand in like you did the other way. Do it exactly the way you did the other way. Now you still have your left on the top. Now do you right on top. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I have to think about it. And it, it, I guess your point is. The other way feels really weird. Yes, yes, that must be it. If I told people, you just have to cross your arms the other way. I know you're used to crossing them this way. You just won't do it, yeah. Or, they won't do it or they'll do it for a little while and then they'll forget and they'll just go back to the old way. But unless you tell them, you know, I will, I have an assassin standing with a gun pointed the back of your head. If you cross your arms the wrong way, uh, he's going to shoot you. I, they'll pay a little more attention. Now, that's not what we usually do. But <laughs> you have to have some sort of incentives, some sort of reinforcement, mm -hmm. some rationale behind it. Yep. You know, you put in the company newsletter, all the people that cross their arms the correct way and how great they're doing and what it meant for the company. You do all these things to get people to reinforce the right behaviors. And then hopefully it becomes the new regular way of doing things. It's kind of like these days we're in this new normal, which isn't really normal yet, but yes, new normal with the coronavirus. And but now they're doing it because we have to, and now they're, they're going to get used to the whole zoom thing, right? Everybody's washing their hands. You know, yeah. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. The funny thing I always tell my wife, we, uh, we were in Hawaii. We flew back from Hawaii as the coronavirus started to expand. I landed in the LA airport and I you know, said, Let, I'll meet you in a minute. I'm going to go to the bathroom. She said, I'm going to the bathroom. And of course, guys, you know, we're in there and out of there. We're so quick. Yes. I ended up coming out about the same time she did because there was this whole line of guys hogging the sinks. Washing Being their safe now, huh? Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's just the new way of being. If guys are doing that. You know, guys are stubborn. <laughs> I'm assuming once this is over, you know, we might not wash our hands a hundred times a day as we're doing now or whatever it is, but we're going to wash them a whole lot more than we did because now we understand how important it is, particularly in the winter cold and flu season, right? Yes. So uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'd like to kind of end it in a little bit of a somewhat off topic, but it's kind of on topic which you kind of touched upon a little bit, which is uh, simulation and gaming. Uh, as you can see, you're obviously familiar with iRacing. I started to mess around with that a little bit too. 
Um, and it sounded like you're not really doing that as much, but you're probably seeing that around the industry a lot more. So tell us about that. Because for me, when I do those, I don't have the feel, the G-force, et cetera. And it's just not the same. It's hard, but it's a good practice for learning the track. So, so maybe you can tell us what you, your thoughts on the whole, the whole thing. Right. So I'll just start with basic simulation. I think that is a fabulous tool. And anybody who wants to be better as a driver, even if you know a particular track, the more you can drive, the better. Because just, again, for me, it's that visual pattern of learning the track. Where do you break? What, what do you want to experiment with? Now, the challenge is if the simulation is bad and you can get away with a lot of things you could never do in a real car, then you may learn some bad habits and you have to watch for that. You know, because I have people who will tell me, hey, I drove a, you know, a 1980 Ferrari Formula One car and I did this time at this track. How did you do in real life? Well, it's a totally different thing in real life, right? You don't have the G-forces and all that said. And sometimes the simulation is not quite great. Um, the worst thing for me is you never get the right brake pedal pressure. It's never the same in any simulator. Yeah, as it is it's the real the mechanics part of it, right? Yeah, and particularly in F1 cars, you know, if if we're doing 200 and and I just lift my foot off the gas, we have one G-force of deceleration, which is just about what it's like if you put your brakes on full stop in your road car. We just get that from aero forces by just lifting our foot. Yeah. Then when we hit oh, the brake, yeah. it's five Gs of deceleration. Mm. Total. And you can't mimic that in a simulator and then as the arrow bleeds off, because I'll put, you know, 400 pounds of pressure on the, on the pedal and the, the tires will not lock up. But once the speed starts to bleed off, then the tires will lock up. So you've got to learn how to get on the brakes and then modulate them at the right time to be able to not lock the brakes up and, and then screw up. Yeah, them. you know, those physics things that you mentioned, they're the only experienced people that know it uh, intimately. Those lessons of making the simulator even better, I would assume, hopefully, it's getting there now, right? Um, maybe you should be a consultant for esports gaming, right, for well, racing. That might be fun to do. I mean, I actually helped Ferrari with their simulator for their drivers. Um, they were, you know, developing it, and it was it was okay, and the drivers were doing okay with it and stuff. But I got in it, and um, I had a, I, I got a the tail loose in a particular corner and I, you know, steered into it and I thought, okay, well, I, I can go harder. I can catch this harder. I can catch this harder. So I went slamming through the corner, the tail came out and I hammered the gas in the middle of the corner. I hammered the gas and it just kind of like straightened the car out. And they're like, how did you do that? And I told them what I did. And they said, did, would that happen in real life? I said, no, of course not. How did you know? <laughs> if you did that in real life, you would have, you know, you yeah, would have yeah. taken the car totally off the track because you're already losing traction and now you're overworking the tires as well. You know, you'd be like like a drifter, except in F1, they don't drift. You just can't, you know, the car snaps and literally you get a few inches of yaw and the car goes around. It's a bug. But you I, found the bug. I found the bug and they so they had to, you know, change that out. But I was just I was just trying to go fast and I was learning their sim to go as fast as I could in their sim. I wasn't trying to be real life. So that's the thing. There are always going to be these kinds of bugs and, you know, real drivers can find them and do those comparisons. But um, still, you know, without the G forces, you know, you can drive the Sims all day and, and go have a sandwich and feel fine. But yeah, you, know, you won't get tired. That's true. One car, 30 minutes and you're ready for a nap. It's yeah. Nice. I, I know what you mean. I, I think I last 15, 20 minutes on a driver's session. So think about it. I get really tired. I can't imagine yours. Um, one last thing is I, I was speaking with a teacher at Ferrari Washington. We were trying to do a uh, simulated racing fun event, right? And so hopefully we can we can get something like that off the ground, which is like an eye racing thing. And we'd love to have your opinion on it set up. And maybe you can join us for fun. Uh, so I'll give a shout out for, for Ferrari Washington and Leticia on that. And since it's kind of relevant, uh, the one last thing I want to end with, and I, I'm sure we can talk forever because you have obviously a rich world of history of things that we can, there's so much in there. Uh, perhaps we can do a comeback interview in a few months or whatever, but you know, um, definitely appreciate you having here. I'd, I'd like to point out this picture that I, that I have on the screen and 
Tell us about this picture. I think this is a great picture for many reasons. Yeah, so this, uh, this looks like we're in at Silverstone with a friend of mine, if I remember right, I think this is Youssef. And um, in our uh, F1 Clienti events, usually they just try to keep everybody out of the garage. I'm kind of the opposite. I, you know, people don't get a chance to see and enjoy and get up close to these Formula One cars ever in their life. And for me, it costs nothing to let somebody sit in the car and get their picture taken. So I will often invite friends in, particularly like Facebook friends or whatever. I'll invite them in the garage, let them sit in the car, take pictures. And you can see in the background, somebody's having the best day of their life. Yes. That's the joy of Ferrari, sharing it with everybody. I mean, I remember getting into your car and I was very careful. You're telling me exactly where to step, how to position my arm a certain way, because there are, there are parts in there that could, you know, and I just realized, wow, this is so tight, but this is so cool. And of course that gave me a lot of joy. So I, I definitely appreciate uh, that time and, and something I'll remember forever because I will never be driving this kind of thing just because I think it's, and, and, and even though you do say, you know, you're not too old for it kind of thing. I don't think I have that gene or the, what you claim you don't have, right? Which is the fear thing. And, and I don't know if you've driven at Summit Point, that long straight, the Summit Point one, um, because that's more of a newbie, newbie track now <laughs> compared to what you're dealing with. There's a straight, the first straight, it's, you're supposed to go really fast and break super late, to me, super late. And I never do it because, you know what, I don't need to save a second or two. I just don't want to take the risk. I feel like I just don't trust that the car won't break in time and things like that. So that I guess that's the difference. Then That's how you divide the drivers, right? Yeah. And I mean, if I were there in a road car with my wife in the passenger seat, I'd probably do just what you did. Don't, you know, make it 80%, 85%. Everybody has a good time. Yep. If I'm trying to set the summit point track record, you can bet I am going as yes. deep as, you know, when we were at um, Road Atlanta a couple of years ago, on the back stretch, we we would be absolutely flat out 200. And it's, it's flat, and then it goes downhill as you're heading towards the left tight left hand turn. So your car is actually accelerating a little, little bit into the braking zone, we would break inside the one mark go down four gears, hang a left and power out of there. And that's the thing that amazed most people is the braking capability of these cars. You're only on the brakes for a second or whatever. And uh, the cars will haul down from 200 to 70 or whatever and flick left and keep going. So yeah, that, that's, that's a very good point. Um, we just don't trust it. I, the, the ones that haven't experienced it. I had one instructor show me. He says, no, trust me, you can brake this late i was like oh really and i was like you know what go ahead drive my car he drove a lap and showed me i was amazed and then of course when it was my turn i got to somewhat closer <laughs> right but i had to feel it and see it to believe it and um that's great well well um thank you for the the time that you know you gave us um you know if there's one advice you can give uh a any one of us with life business is there anything you'd like to uh to tell us well, look, I mean, I think for racing, the, the more seat time you can get, the better. So if you've got a really expensive car and you can't afford to race, but mm -hmm. twice a year, sell it, go get a less expensive car so you can race five or six ah, times. That's a good point. Extra seat time really makes all the difference. And particularly because if you haven't accumulated, like, like um, Malcolm Gladwell says, to reach mastery takes 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours, yes. A lot of racing. So if you're only going to race a couple times a year in a car, you're not gonna get anywhere close to that. The second thing I would say is just in life in general, in the middle, everything looks like a disaster, right? You have all these great plans. You gotta believe in the end, it's gonna work out right. But in the middle, it always looks like a disaster. Just recognize that, don't fret about it, do the best you can, but just keep powering forward. You know that there's gonna be an end to it. You know it's gonna work out if you really you know, put your brain to it. But in the middle, no matter what project, no matter what event, no matter whatever, in the middle, it always looks like complete disaster. And just, just accept that, you know? And the third thing I would say, I mean, my, uh, my motto on my social media pages are life's too short to drink bad wine and drive bad cars. <laughs> um, 
I think for a lot of us, 2020 has kind of showed us the, uh, the reality of that life may be too short, as we've yes. seen over 100,000 people die in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, a lot of them are, you know, age 50 and above. Well, I'm in that category. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to make sure I live with that motto and uh, enjoy the best out of what I can along the way. And you're passing on your, your lessons to us. We appreciate it. Uh, you're an inspiration. Appreciate your time here. And for those that are interested, uh, Bud Moeller's uh, page would be on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, that's it right there on the screen. You can look that up. It works for both of them. Uh, actually, the Facebook transitions transfers it properly. So I think they have a special redirect just for you, Bud. Great. <laughs> All right. Take care and Thanks. appreciate Thank it. All righty. Thank you.